Hi, I'm Dave McMahon. I'm an attorney and co-founder of the West Virginia Surface Owners' Rights Organization. The Surface Owners' Rights Organization is partly funded by the Dunn Foundation that is also partially funding this video. This video is also partially funded by the West Virginia Environmental Council and some of its members. We're standing here at the entrance to Kanawha State Forest, nine miles south of Charleston, West Virginia. Of course, it was originally owned both surface and minerals by private interests. From 1888 until 1907, there were six coal mines operating here. They were served by a narrow gauge uh, railroad that ran through, through what is now the park and down to South Charleston. In 1907, the geological survey map showed there were 131 houses, three schools, three churches, and a little town called Chilton. After that, nothing much happened to it until World War I, when the narrow gauge railroad was repaired so they could come in and take all the metal out that had been left behind by the mines to be used for World War I. Then in the 1930s, along came the Civilian Conservation Corps. This was a program under the Roosevelt administration to put people to work because of the Great Depression. What the Conservation Corps did was buy the surface, and they had those men tear down all the old houses and all those things, and construct some very nice uh, um, old picnic shelters, some, some of them made out of uh, the chestnut trees that died in the blight. Then in World War II, again, people were after scrap metal and probably pulled some of the metal casing that should still be around. But mostly I want to talk about the history of oil and gas drilling in the park. The DEP says there are about 40 wells in the park right now, though we know there are lots more than that that aren't in the DEP records, that are in the geological survey records, and there are lots more than that, mostly before 1929, that aren't in anybody's records. The first re records we have of a well being drilled is in 1912. Then in 1928, we have records from the United Fuel Gas Company that did serious drilling, which became Columbia, which became Chesapeake, to whatever it is now. Some of their wells are still here. The earliest wells were, of course, relatively shallow to a limestone. Um, then the United Fuel Gas came along, started drilling more. Then 20s and 30s, they were into a limestone, but then into the Oriskany sandstone up through World War II. After that, they discovered the Newburgh sandstone, and that's significant because that is a formation that has hydrogen sulfide, and throughout this tour, we'll, let you, we'll tell you where we are smelling hydrogen sulfide from various leaks. From 1961 to 2007, they drilled the Devonian Shale. Those were the first shale wells that were drilled uh, because there was a special tax break for, for tight, tight shales, because all the oil and gas really forms in the shale formations. And then over the eons, it works its way upward through the sandstones and the limestones. And that's where, where, where until 2008, we could produce it from. They were porous and permeable, and vertical wells could be put down into there, a small fracture done, and oil and gas and, and, and produced, mostly almost all gas in Kanawha State Forest. But then in 2008, the drilling stopped in Kanawha State Forest because of the, the Marcellus Shale horizontal drilling tsunami in the northern part of the state. The purpose of this video is threefold. First, there, there are thousands and thousands of people who use Kanawha State Forest annually, and they see these oil and gas features in the park, and it'd be good to, to let them know exactly what they are and what they're for. Second, is we just want to show how some of the basics of how oil and gas well drilling, at least conventional oil and gas well drilling, before the Marcellus Shale and Horizontal occurred for people's information. The third purpose that really inspired this video is to use Kanawha State Forest as an example of industry irresponsibility and the lack of state laws and state funding to enforce, to oversee oil and gas drilling. The result is methane leaks, the result is unplugged wells and orphaned wells, and all that needs dealt with by the legislature. I hasten to say that almost everybody I meet in the industry I like, but the industry as a whole is irresponsible and action needs taken to rein it in and solve its problems. A number of things need done. We need to pass the Orphan Well Prevention Act that requires money to put, be put aside up front to plug wells by the companies that drill them when they are no longer useful. The current system of bonding has absolutely failed. We also need a lot more funding for oil and gas inspectors. They have 23 inspectors for 75,000 wells, 20,000 tanks, 200 permits a year, 8 to 15 Marcellus wells going at the same time. The result is leaks. The result is 
wells that are unplugged that should be plugged and some that stay unplugged so often, so long, that the people that drill them go out of business and leave them orphaned for the state to plug. First, we're gonna show you a well that has already been drilled and is in operation. We can't show you a well that is being drilled because wells like this are no longer being drilled. This is a conventional vertical well to a sandstone. It's the wells that have been drilled for uh, up until 2008. These are the kind of wells that were drilled. However, with the advent of the technology to, to drill into the shale formations, only shale wells are drilled. One of these wells might cost $300,000 to drill. A shale well might cost $3 million to drill, but it will get 60 times the gas, so you can see it is more economical. And actually, if gas is going to be produced, if it's to be produced, then it's actually safer to do a horizontal well because there's only one penetration of the groundwater, et cetera, uh, to produce 60 times the gas. That would require 60 penetrations otherwise. To illustrate the change in well drilling technology, uh, in 2007, there were over 2,000 permits issued by the DEP for a conventional vertical well to a sandstone. In 2022, there were only nine, and those were to secondary recovery. On the other hand, there are two or 300 permits a year for horizontal shale wells. This is what is called the wellhead. This well is, was now owned, is now owned by Diversified Oil and Gas. I have the sensor wand in my hand, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to report that this well does not appear to be leaking any methane. Can't smell it, doesn't get sense, censored. And in fact, one of the good points about Diversified is after the Princeton McGill study came out saying that a lot of these wells were leaking gas, they figured out that it would be good to send their well tenders out with gas, with gas sensors. I mean, if the gas leaks, it's just wasteful. Um, it's, it gyps royalty owners, it gyps state tax collections. Sometimes it stinks, and this one doesn't. Um, and it's, you know, there is this thing called climate change and global warming, which is caused by methane. So, how, how, was, how was this well drilled? Well, the first thing that happened is they put a casing down, a metal, they drilled a hole down through the water table and maybe even the coal. And then they put a metal pipe in it and they wanted to cement that in, make it solid so gas couldn't leak up or out, so water couldn't leak down, et cetera, et cetera. So they calculated the amount of cement it would take to go between the outside of this metal pipe and the inside of the hole, and they put that down the center, put something called a pig behind it, put water pressure behind it, and push, and push the cement up around the outside, hopefully return to the surface. If it didn't, that could be a problem. Then, and then they had to wait eight hours for the cement to harden, which is one of the ways where some wells did have problems. And if you want to know more about this, there is a very good slideshow on the Surface Owners Rights Organization website, just Google West Virginia Soro and look down the right side for how a well is drilled and what can go wrong. So the first part was drilling the first hole, setting the surface casing, cementing it in, and then they, they drilled down further, and I'm gonna simplify a little. They went all the way down to the producing formation, and then, um, and then they put another casing, this casing, all the way down to the bottom, and they cemented it into the into the formation below, they didn't bring cement all the way to the surface. That's uncemented casing that would be taken out uh, when, when a well is plugged. So the gas comes up here, uh, and then they need to measure it. So we'll get to that in a second. Sometimes uh, wells get clogged up with paraffin or other things, so they'll put material in here, in this little tank, uh, that will clean out the well uh, and use pressure somehow to blow it to blow things down in the well to clean out the well. So that's basically how the, well, how the gas first comes out of the ground. Oil and gas is formed when ocean sediments go to the bottom of the ocean and then, layer, then layers of sandstone and other rock get placed over top. Because of that, often there is some water that comes up with the gas when it comes up. And sometimes that has, often it has salt in it. So we don't want to, they don't want to be shipping the salt water to market so they have to get the salt water out. And this is a, a, a mechanism. So the gas comes from the well, goes here, uh, the water settles out, and when enough water builds up, there is a float valve on the end of this that then blows the brine water over to that tank, which I'll show you more about 
in the meantime. Now, I would congratulate Diversify. This is a relatively well-maintained well, no leaks. Uh, I, I, I give them the benefit of the doubt on this holding the float valve that this well is old enough that not much brine is made so they, they don't need to uh, have it up, happen automatically. They probably just come around manually uh, and trip it. Uh, and that may, in fact, minimize the amount of gas that comes out. So gas with some brine in it comes here, gets separated out in this separator. Uh, the gas goes on to the meter I'm about to show you. The brine every now and then gets pumped into the brine tank. As the well produces gas, methane here, uh, of course they want to measure it so they know how much they produce in order to uh, pay royalties and just calculate the gas they're producing. Um, that's done with an, what's called an orifice meter. This is the pipeline where the gas is going from the wellhead to market. This is the orifice. There's a hole in the middle of that that's a certain particular size. And they measure the pressure on either side of the, that hole, the, the gas pressure on either side of that hole. And they record that and calculate it. And that tells them how much gas has gone through and how much gas is being produced. But they have to record that somehow. And it used to be they recorded that on a big card that circulated and had two needles that recorded the pressures. And once a month, they would come out and replace the card and then use that to calculate. This well is more modern, however. This well uses solar power to power a gizmo that conveys the amount produced either by a sat phone or cell phone to the home office so they know how much is being produced. Again, the brine is separated out over at the separator and every now and then gets pumped into this brine tank. Though it's brine means salt water, oftentimes there are more things than that. And on rare occasions, they have been known to explode. Uh, this one I'm not worried about. Uh, it, is, it has only has about this much brine in it, uh, maybe a, a foot, uh, and it seems to be doing fine. And then every now and then, if the tank fill, when the tank fills up, they'll bring a truck out uh, and pump, take the brine away and dispose of it, hopefully properly. You'll notice that around the tank is a dike, with the calculation of the dike being, if the tank would spring a leak, all the brine would accumulate behind the dike and not go out on, into the stream over there or out onto the land. Now the problem with having a dike is sometimes it collects water, um, and even sometimes crawdads, it can do crawdad holes, but if it does fill up with water, then they have a pipe they can open which will let the fresh water out. So again, it'll be ready in case the brine leaks out of the tank. This diversified well is in pretty good shape. It makes enough gas to sell for maybe 12 or $13,000 a year gross. So it's not time to plug it yet. And I've never, never been able to find any leaks or neglect. But the problem is that diversified has so many wells that it's not gonna be able to plug. They've told their investors in Great Britain in order to convince them to invest that they're wells will continue to be profitable up until 2047. Unfortunately, the other disclosures they gave in order to show that they won't have a plugging liability shows that in 2049, when these wells are no longer profitable, they'll have probably 10,000 wells in West Virginia that need to be plugged, and they don't have the money from the profits from the wells that are producing to do it. That's, we need an Orphan Well Prevention Act to stop these things from happening. This is a facility called a drip. When gas comes up out of the ground, it often has some humidity to it. And, and as it goes through lines, this is, one of, this is a production line from probably from one of the wells we've seen today. Um, if the pipe is colder than the gas going through it, the, the water in the gas will condense on the inside of the pipe. And at a low place, the water will run down and create a puddle inside the, inside the line and freeze, cutting off production. So to prevent that, at low points in the line, they install a drip. And what happens is, as the water comes in, it drips down into this tank. And then every now and then, they'll come along and put something here and get the water out. The problem with this drip is that if you were standing here right now, you would smell rotten eggs. In fact, the people that just walked by us smelled rotten eggs. And my friends that have walked this trail say it smells like rotten eggs here. And I've smelled it that way for years. And in fact, there is a leak here.
that says high levels of methane, and the smell is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide at, and I want to get these numbers right, I'm going to look at my cheat sheet. At 0.1 parts per million, maybe some people can smell it. At 0.7 parts per million, almost everybody can smell it. At 10 parts per million, your eyes will water. At 100 parts per million, it burns out your nose, and you can't smell it anymore even if it's there. And that would be bad if you were in a room because either the hydrogen sulfide had gone away or you were smelling a level of hydrogen sulfide that could kill you. Now, that's not going to happen here because of the breezes, etc. But this is a leak that should have been taken care of. The well tenders go by here on a regular basis, and if all the people I've mentioned can smell it, then you know they can. But when has an oil and gas inspector come by? Again, a problem with not enough oil and gas inspectors. I doubt if one has been by here, unless somebody issued a complaint for some reason. They have told us that back when they had 18 inspectors, they really just responded to complaints and did permits and that kind of thing. So we need more than 23 inspectors for 75,000 wells so that you can buy here and, and, and cure this. Now, I will give diversified credit when the Princeton McGill University study came out that said that 53% of producing wells were leaking an average of nine cubic feet of gas per hour. Diversified was smart enough to say, well, that's not good. Um, and so they came out and they gave their inspectors well testers. Now this one, I got on Amazon for a hundred bucks and it doesn't tell me which, which is coming, which thane or which, which gas is coming out, but it senses methane and combustible gases. You can smell hydrogen sulfide if you can smell hydrogen sulfide, it smells like rotten eggs. Other things that are sometimes mixed in with gas are pentane, hexane, and those kinds of things. And those smell like gasoline. But, and there is some methane, we'll show you later, that in fact, methane itself, you can't smell at all. So the industry should have all their people out there with these sensors to test for methane leaks. Diversified has said when it started doing testing, it found out that most of the leaking methane did not come from big, job, big fixed jobs. It came from little fixed jobs, and this is an example. This whole facility does not need replaced. They just need to tighten up the seals that are leaking, and if they'd done that, this wouldn't be happening. This well and this facility is a classic abandoned, unplugged well that still has a responsible operator. It's not orphaned yet. It was discovered by a mountain biker, pointed out to us, and it is on the DEP website, but it hasn't produced gas in over 10 years um, and should have been plugged a long time ago by the company that called Pillar that has the, uh, that is the responsible operator for this well. So after the tank was, was discovered, we hunted around to find the wellhead for this uh, well that's been unplugged uh, by Pillar Energy. And we did finally find this, and you can tell from the surrounding area that at least the well pad certainly was not maintained. Uh, this well, I'm gonna refer to my notes here, um, was, was originally drilled in 1943 to the Oriskany, and in 1965 it was drilled to 5,200 feet to the Newburg, and that's significant because that's why it's possible to smell the gas that's leaking out of this. I'll explain more about that later. But, but the well is 50 years old. From 1995 to 2013, it only produced, produced enough gas to gross $250 a year. Should probably have been plugged then. Um, in, tw in that 25 years, it changed hands four times. None of those people plugged it when they should have. Since 2015, pretty clear it should be plugged because it has produced nothing since 2015. 25% of the wells that are shut in, according to a Princeton study, shut in like this, means turned off, uh, are, are leaking gas in, in about a cubic foot uh, every five hours. This one, as you can tell by our beep, is certainly leaking. But it is the classic example of a well that should have been plugged. It should have been plugged for the benefit of the leaseholder, uh, back when it was only producing $250 a year. It should be plugged for the surface owner, certainly, since 2015 when it hasn't produced at all. 
Again, an example of an unplugged well with a responsible operator, hasn't plugged it, leaking methane into the atmosphere, 5,000 parts per million right where it's leaking, and it can be smelled down, downwind. Did you notice this? This is a monument that is supposed to be placed every time a well is properly plugged. In order to properly plug a well, first you, as I explained earlier, a lot of the, there is casing down the well that some of it is cemented in. Some of the casing is not cemented in, it's just loose. So the driller goes down and cuts off the uncemented casing at the bottom, pulls it up out, and then fills the well with bentonite gel and um, and with cement bridges at various la layers. The cement bridges will be like above and, be above and below a coal seam, above and below another uh, oil and gas layer, um, and then cement through the surface to the groundwater that's, imp that's very important. Um, if you want to know more about that, the, just Google West Virginia surface owners. We have a slideshow about how a well should be plugged and what can go wrong and why there's such an incentive not not to do it right. When I first got into this area of law and science, back in the early 1980s, a gentleman named Dodd was head of the Office of Oil and Gas. He was older then, but he told me his first job in the industry was working for a plugging company. And they would get a contract for three wells, to plug three wells, and they would go to the first well uh, with a truck of full cement sacks. Um, and they would use that cement, mix it, put it down the well, to plug it correctly, call the oil and gas inspector and say, look, here's the empty cement sacks we plugged the well. Then he said they would go to the second well site, sit around for a well, put three or four sacks of cement, new cement down, call the inspector and show them the empty cement sacks they'd shown him at the first well. It is so easy to cheat and not get caught. And I've heard of more recent stories. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we need more oil and gas inspectors than what we have. The 2023 legislature Said, gave us enough money to, gave the state enough money to hire 23 oil and gas inspectors. But that's 23 inspectors for 75,000 active wells, not including the ones that the Geological Survey knows about before 1929. In addition to those 75,000 wells, 20,000 associated tanks. Also, there were two or 300 new horizontal well permits each year, and the inspector has to go out and inspect, particularly if it's a new well on a on a new pad, how the pad is built, and they have to look at the permit to see if it, the, the plugging, the, I'm sorry, the casing uh, program is proper. And in addition, there are anywhere from eight to 15 horizontal Marsalis wells drilling 24 seven. So that's not nearly enough inspectors. If we use a guide from uh, a national organization, it says we should have 127 inspectors in order to inspect our wells on a regular, all the wells on a regular basis. But we definitely need more, particularly to watch and make sure that plugging is done right because it's so easy to cheat and the result can be bad groundwater, stuff leaking out on the ground, methane leaking to the air, and sometimes no way, even if you find the, the problems, it's hard to prove that it came from the, the, the poor plugging of the well. This is an example of an orphaned well that has no responsible operator any longer. And it's a reason why we need to do things to prevent orphan wells from happening. If you can imagine this on your property, uh, many of them leak, um, and they certainly reduce property value. These are additional facilities that came along with that orphaned well. Um, in particular, I believe this is a pipeline from a number of wells in the area, and it comes up above ground here for measuring using an orifice uh, in a way that I've shown you at the earlier well but it's here behind, and there was no bonding to get, to get it taken care of, um, and the operator just left it behind. Okay, we're gonna show you one more orphan well out here in Kanawha State Forest. Uh, it's different in three respects from the other orphan we showed you. First of all, I've got my hand on something called the conductor pipe. That's not important, you can ignore that. 
when all wells are drilled, they put a conductor pipe down at the very top just so the topsoil doesn't fall down in the hole while they're drilling. Um, inside of that, though, you'll notice you can see the, um, the casing that was cemented in, hopefully, to the surface. Um, and inside of that, you can see the casing that went all the way down to the productive formation. And the second thing you can see about that is it's bubbling. The water has come, gotten into this, and it is methane that's coming out in a big way. And the third thing that's different about this well, and it's important, is that while we could smell hydrogen sulfide back at the pillar well, and we could smell hydrogen sulfide at the drip, we can't smell what's coming out of here. Methane is odorless, and it only has odor if hydrogen sulfide is, comes up with it, or if pentane or those come with it, or when it gets processed and sent to your house, the gas company actually puts uh, mercaptan in it so you can smell leaks but it doesn't have smell on its own. So it, all industry members, when they go out to their wells, shouldn't just sniff around and say, oh, it must not be leaking. They should have sensors. This one cost me about $100 on Amazon and see if it's leaking methane and take care of the problem. And here's one of the worst problems of orphan wells not being plugged. According to a 1957 topographic map, there was a well here in 1957, but can't find it now. It's not on the DEP website. It's not even on the Geological Survey website. It, uh, it was probably um, plugged by in World War II or World War I when they just took the casing. Or maybe there was a farmer here then who had it as a field and wanted the well gone, simply cut off the metal top and put a hickory log down it because hickory logs were supposed to last longer than other logs. Right now, the DEP is plugging an orphaned well that's underneath a barn and they're having to deal with removing the barn in order to plug the orphan well because someone didn't know the well was there and build a barn on top of it. I hope you've enjoyed our video. I hope you've learned something about Kanawha State Forest. I hope you've learned something about the conventional well drilling that went on in Kanawha State Forest. And I hope we've shown you how the irresponsibility of the industry and the lack of enough laws and funding from the legislature has caused problems of leaky methane, wells that should be plugged that still have a responsible operator, orphan wells that result when we don't make responsible operators plug their wells. And imagine if you would, if all these problems were on your property, what it does to property values to people across the state. There's something else the Surface Owners Rights Organization would like to have, and that's a land reunion. The people that own the surface should have a way to get to own their minerals. And I haven't shown anything about that, and I haven't said anything about that, so I'll sing about it. Does a dollar for an acre paid 100 years ago Give anyone the right to steal our souls forever? We say no We're gonna take back our water We're gonna take back our streams We're gonna take back our rivers Let them flow like our dreams We're gonna take back our meadows We're gonna take back our mountains We're gonna take back West Virginia Let our lives flow free again